Thank you very much. Nestor is a Cuban media artist who works uh, a lot um, with intervention into like kind of social phenomena or in uh, like communities. I came to Cuba uh, six years ago uh, uh, as an anthropologist, but I also have like kind of a background and a formation as a filmmaker. And when we both met, we found that we actually have a very similar practice. We're both interested in the social impact of digital technology uh, and local alternatives to the current global distribution of technological power. And our process, both of our process uh, already was, before we even met, like very research-based. We both collaborate, loved collaborating with local communities, involving them in our own projects from their conception. And yeah, uh, as Jan has also said, and what is like kind of the topic of our talk, our field site, where I have been like doing years of uh, ethnographic research and where Cuba actually lives, uh, where Nestor actually lives and works, <laughs> is uh, Cuba, which has a very um, unique digital culture. No? So what is peculiar about the internet in Cuba? Um, the Cuban government has long restricted its citizens' access to digital technology and the internet for, um, because of their fear of freedom uh, of information and expression and uh, which uh, led to um, the island being one of the least connected countries in the world until only a few years ago. And then there's also, as you probably all know, the US embargo that restricts access um, to many um, digital devices like all big global digital companies that are based out of the US, uh, like Zoom or the Apple App Store or everything that involves all online payment is basically not accessible uh, from Cuba. But access uh, in recent years has changed quite recently. Maybe Nestor can explain a bit. Yeah, like um, the history of what is happening with the internet, like uh, before 2015 was almost impossible to get connection for anywhere, like just some specific institutions, uh, universities, some professionals, be, you know, have the options to get internet, uh, but everything was like a very, very slow, even in universities, like internet was like uh, the water of the oceans, like touch you, uh, one second and you lost for an hour and coming back again and like that and was impossible to have like a, an experience online uh, you know with this connection with this so bad connection uh, but the reality of the internet in Cuba changed very hard when in 2015 for first time the government decided to put internet available for all the Cuban citizens, not just in hotels or in these institutions. And they, uh, the government created with the only uh, company that, uh, you know, communication company that, that we have in Cuba that is part of the government, Etexa. They create this hotspot in different park, in different public areas in the cities. This is what happened with the internet in this period of time. The Cubans connect to, to this in this like a hotspot was using this like a cars with codes and, and all the internet was like uh, per hour. This change very hard, like very radical, like uh, the reality in Cuba and means that, you know, a lot of people come into the parts and like families full, you can see full families uh, in communication with his family from outside Cuba that was not uh, able before. Right now, like uh, in 2011, the internet changed again, the reality changed very hard again because the government uh, opened mobile data. 18. 18, yeah, uh, like, like what we'll have right now. And also right now we'll have like a um, 4G even. Like um, even, you know, the internet is changing, Cubans, like, and because also for all this period of time with no internet connection, Cubans have like, um, you know, developing a lot of phenomenon and practice that uh, in a way, uh, you know, fix this problem with the connection. Mm. And tonight we're going to talk about two of these like kind of alternative data distribution networks, uh, how you could call them. One is called El Paquete Semanal, the other one is called ESNET, and the two works we're presenting uh, here, uh, here in Osmosa and in Axuma, they both like each of the works deals with one of these like alternative infrastructures that uh, Cubans have like kind of invented uh, even like when there was no internet access to distribute like data like uh, new movies, television series, Brazilian or Turkish telenovelas, new music. Um, yeah, and these like these like networks are like kind of based on like, based on, like kind of offline technology. Um, yeah, and Nestor is gonna start yeah, one of the, the Yeah, one of the big phenomenon that is like, uh, the people can say that you can, for understand the weekly packet, we can say that it's a kind of a version of, of internet, like 
is a uh, exactly one terabyte of information in a folder structure in one hard drive. People have different ways to consume in the weekly packet. For example, you can just go to this place with a computer. It's also like uh, places like this one that you can see in all the corners of the city. It's like a super, super popular. And we can say that, you know, 11 million of people consume in the weekly packet. It's a human infrastructure of distribution of, of information completely offline. And you can find like a, a, a huge variety of media inside the weekly packet. This mostly focus in uh, entente entertainment materials, but also you can find a lot of micro phenomenons and you know, like uh, documental film, software, applications of mobile, like it's, it's huge. Yeah, and how this data is actually collected is that um, in Cuba you have like kind of people who have like kind of privileged internet access because they work, for example, in government run like tourist hotels or like at government institutions, um, like, like universities. And there exists this like kind of clandestine network, you could say, that kind of uses these like kind of government infra, in, internet infrastructure to download like kind of as much as pirated data that they can find on the internet. No, like very often, uh, particular people are specialized, for example, in like downloading um, new Adobe software packages or like new mm. Hollywood films or new HBO series. And then there's like two big compilation houses in, my, in, in Havana that like kind of compile this like one terabyte data collection. Um, it's still like kind of one terabyte that is like distributed every week, like really like neatly organized in like kind of different folders um, because um, the bottleneck in this like infrastructure is the people who actually then deliver this like data collection throughout the whole country. These people are called paqueteros and you can basically have a subscription with them. Then uh, this person that owns maybe five or ten one terabyte hard drives comes to your house, uh, leaves the hard drive with you for a few hours or a day and then uh, you can copy whatever you want, uh, pay like two or three dollars and then it's kind of the next person's. Turn. And this like infrastructure is so massive, no? Like we're talking about scale uh, in this like kind of series of events, and we have here like kind of an like underground alternative data distribution system that has really like kind of a massive like kind of nationwide impact and reaches like almost like kind of the whole population, hmm. no? So. Um, uh, from Havana, these data travel, as we see here, on, on, on hard drives uh, throughout the whole country with the local bus network. So, and within like kind of one day, um, it has really reached like kind of the farther the, the farthest corners uh, of the island. And then this data obviously is also um, like travels through networks of friends and families. It is uh, sold on these like neighborhood copy stores that Nestor hmm. showed, and it's like really a massive phenomenon. It's like how most people in Cuba actually consume. Um, digital data like films. No, and even though that kind of people have mobile internet now since four years, um, yeah, the internet you is still like kind of paid by um, by data packages, which are so expensive that no Cuban who is right in their mm -hmm. mind would actually stream a film on their mobile phones or on their laptop because it's just too expensive to stream a mm -hmm. film because you have this like offline data um, distribution infrastructure in place. And also like, uh, you know, to understand more how easy is this distribution, it's like uh, for Cubans, it's normal to have like a hard drive in the back or a USB in the packet all the time. This means that even, you know, like uh, the people are not consuming directly the weekly packet are even copy films or some data from friends that are, are really consuming the weekly packet. And this, you know, structure is like a super, super natural and is coming from years and years with no internet connection and will take more time to understand more how mm. the internet work and change all this structure. But from now, the paquete is stronger than never. Yeah, so it's really like kind of a sneaker network, you could say, no? Like kind of a network that is based on like kind of physical data distribution from one person uh, to the other. And um, yeah, this is actually something that really inspired us for, for the work for our video expanded cinema installation Memoria that is currently on view in uh, Axioma at the moment. And our idea um, in our like kind of year long uh, investigation of like this El Paquete phenomenon was like kind of to take this reality uh, that like kind of this like kind of real world Cuban invention and mix it um, with like kind of elements from one of the earliest, uh, earliest cyberpunk short stories. Um, so um, 
as you probably all know, cyberpunk is this science fiction genre that has actually deeply shaped how we all think about the internet, no? Like kind of terms and concepts like cyberspace, avatar, the metaverse, no? All these terms that are all in our minds when we think about the internet nowadays are all coined by cyberpunk writers, no? And most of these stories from the 80s by authors like William Gibson or uh, Neil Stevenson they actually take place in, in our time, no? In the years 2021, 22, 23, no? I think Blade Runner uh, is set in 2019, no? So these like kind of stories from the 80s basically describe our reality now. And what we wanted to do uh, was like kind of a documentary remake of uh, like one of the very earliest uh, cyberpunk uh, short stories by William Gibson, which is called Johnny Mnemonic, which is from 1981, I think. And John Mnemonic, the main character of the story, is basically a data courier who has a hard drive implanted in his head and acts as a physical data transporter for data that is too sensitive to be uploaded to the global internet. So basically has the job of a Cuban paquetero. And um, yeah, we were actually interested in like kind of this productive collusion between like kind of this real life content, uh, a context uh, of the Cuban paqueta and the work of fiction. Um, because like we felt like both phenomena or like both kind of stories basically um, explore alternative imaginations of, the, of, of our mainstream capitalist consumerist version of the internet, no? the one that we are left with today. So like kind of, kind of uh, mixing like kind of an, a sci-fi alternative vision of the internet with like kind of a real life alternative network. And to adapt the story to the Cuban media reality, we approached uh, Eric Mota, who is uh, Cuba's most well-known uh, cyberpunk science fiction writer, to write us like kind of a screenplay adaptation um, of, that, of that short story. And cyberpunk is actually a literary genre that has quite a peculiar presence in Cuba, because these dystopian and alienated societies that the genre uh, presented were uniquely similar to how Cuban science fiction writers also experienced their own social reality. No cyberpunk novels mainly arrived in Cuba in the 1990s, exactly on these like kind of informal media distribution networks that we research about. And just at the time, uh, at this like um, famous time, which uh, is like called the special period, when uh, the Soviet Union, when the so socialist camp fell and Cuba from one day to the next was basically without any subsidies from the Soviet Union, no? Like, Here's like a, a quick quote uh, by Eric, I'm not gonna read it out loud, but he basically says that cyberpunk offers this like kind of um, perspective through which you can also like see or describe this Cuban apocalypse, <laughs> you could say, uh, that happened or this ecological disaster. Yeah, the, the own reality of Cuba is very like, the aesthetic is very cyberpunk. It's like uh, places for repairing things in any corner, like even for memoria, for filming memoria, was easy sometimes find locations because are just the reality is just like a, a good enough for create the history that we want to find and this is why uh, you know like uh, for us was very interesting this idea of this gender that is have like a, is very strong in the Cuban reality and it's matching perfectly with the idea with the with this with this history that. Mm -hmm. that we are playing in memoria. Yeah, and a, lo a big part of, uh, of, mem uh, of memoria of the work is also um, a lot of found footage um, that plays a, quite a big role in the work. Um, and that, uh, that is also material um, that comes from El Paquete Semanal and specifically like a super interesting artwork um, that Nesto has done with an American artist, yeah. uh, Julia Weist. In 2017, uh, I made one of the first uh, exhibitions about the weekly packet, and the central piece was in collaboration with Julia Wells, uh, a New York uh, uh, artist. And um, we'll develop and together our archive. We are having like a one year of the weekly packet. It's a server with uh, uh, 52 terabytes of information. The weekly packet is completely, is completely ephemeral, and this is the only server that exists for more than one week. Because normally this business just de delayed everything and you know over copy all the new information and we'll take all the fun fit film like fun footage from for memoria from this uh, archiving mm. um, project. Yeah, and we also try to like really find shooting locations that correspond with like William Gibson cyberpunk imagination. So. Um, for example, um, yeah, we used uh, Havana's Chinatown, Barrio Chino, as a stand-in for these like Asian mega cities in which these like early cyberpunk stories are always placed. Uh, um, the abandoned amusement, amusement park in which uh, Jones, the cyber-enhanced dolphin, who is also a CIA veteran and who saves Johnny in like kind of the at the end of the story, uh, we found this location in, in an equally defunct uh, in the equally defunct Aquario Nacional. 
uh, in, in, in Havana. Uh, we used a lot of like kind of images of like Cuba after like drone imagery um, that like independent journalists filmed after Havana, after one of the floods that like kind of put half of Havana underwater. And this is also a reference to Eric Motta's uh, uh, Havana Underwater cyberpunk trilogy. Exactly. And uh, what was also like kind of as we as we like always try to work really like kind of collaboratively with like kind of local communities, uh, I think the most important uh, connection or collaboration for us with, was with like uh, Copincha. Yeah, Copincha is uh, the first hacker space in, uh, in Havana. They are focused in the idea of like, uh, you know, developing like understand more like all this practice or recycle or repairing uh, you know that will that already exists in Havana and they also are working with different different you know open software open uh, hardware philosophy they are trying to develop in all these you know um, uh, technologies in Cuba and try to not just like uh, understand as a community how they this technology can be used yeah, for make a better the Cuban context. Uh, also, they want to, you know, make, we are like all the time making like a workshops to try to teach in older people how, you know, use this type of technology. Yeah. Also, like this, this specifically workshop was very interesting. Um, was like a one, um, um, one artist that the name is like a Michel um, Laufer. And he came into Havana, he um, and developing a workshop in relation with the idea of like, um, I don't know how to say that. Biohacking. Then. Yeah, biohacking. And um, what's very interesting because eight, um, eight members of, of the community uh, just putting like a, a small ship here for open the door of Copincha. And was like a very severe point. Yeah, thing. so exactly. No, because like the cyberpunk genre also always plays with this idea of like kind of. Um, you uh, like technological implants in the body, you know? Um, yeah, and like kind of, so they're all like kind of very avid uh, science fiction uh, readers uh, at Copincha. Uh, Eric Motta, for example, has also organized a series of talks where he spoke about like cyberpunk and uh, solar punk fiction uh, within the community. And um, yeah, Copincha members describe themselves as like uh, citizens of a broken world and they are really like working and trying to build a resilient future also like, um, not only to overcome the scarcities in Cuba, but also to like meet the challenges um, that not only late socialist Cuba faces, but all of human uh, civilization in the face of catastrophic climate change. And also, they're very interested in like plastic recycling, for example. Um, they're experimenting a lot with 3D printing at the moment, and they're always trying to find these like kind of low-tech solutions that are based on ideals of like resourcefulness and self-sufficiency and autonomy, you know, like, just like this um, famous uh, William uh, Gibson dictum that the street will always find uh, its, uh, its uses for things and its uses for technology. I think this is exactly what this Copincha community um, really lives, you know? And we collaborated with them um, for the costumes, for example, for the props um, that, um, uh, for example, like kind of the, the, the micro chips, uh, the USB ports that our main characters have in their heads, but also uh, and particularly for like kind of uh, the sculptural element of the yeah. installation. This is the central sculpture that we'll have right now in the exhibition of Memoria. And all this, this is a 3D model of the design of the, of the, of the, of the computer. The idea of this computer is like a, is a offline server that actually is the, um, playing the four videos in synchronized and also have like a, a code inside that is degrade, degradating the video every day. Um, like what is happening in the memory, like in the, for the mind character of, of memoria, like he's lo losing his memories um, in, the, in, the t in the time of, of memoria. And um, all this like uh, chassis is made using like a 3D printed, but also uh, this uh, plastic filament is making from Copincha using recycled plastic in Cuba. And also this is a small example how the code is working day by day. Yeah, so basically what the software does is that um, we have like kind of a batch script running and one program like kind of deletes segments of the video continuously so that they can be overwritten afterwards and then another program overrides these empty segments uh, with like copy information copied randomly from other parts of the video. So it's a bit like a cancer that kind of grows over the video, no? It, it produces like kind of these glitches and the like kind of video progressively 
degrades and that was like our way to like kind of find an aesthetic relation to, to this like kind of data uh, load and memory loss that like the real Johnny Mnemonic in, in, the, in the cyberpunk short story uh, experiences. Another project that we actually working together before this project and was also in relation with the weekly packet was this video game that the name was Packet Town. Packet Town was like a, a video game that the idea was like a try to show the history of the weekly packet. We we'll research a lot about you know all these like uh, changes per years and the you know we understand the weekly packet not just like this phenomenon of distribution of like information in hard drive. We understand that. <laughs> The distribution is also like a super interesting for us, like for understand more the Cuban reality. And before like this democratization of technology in Cuba that allow citizens like have computers and hard drive, um, and all the medias in relation with entertainment material was distributed uh, in this like a the, like a the ground practice or in this uh, the ground like uh, systems. Yeah. And Nestor's grandfather even was in that business yeah. already in the 1970s. I have a personal background in relation with the weekly packet and will discover that, you know, in the in the 1970s, like uh, when, like, the, just after the revolution, uh, my grandfather, for example, have like a, a having, like, he have a business for rent books. And after, like, you know, the revolution, he can just, he can continue uh, renting, like, books or selling books. And he started renting books like a completely the ground. And this was the beginning of the idea of the net of the weekly packet. Like after the books, he changed for uh, the videotapes, you know, like a B B B H C um, VHS. VHS, B um, video movies in videotapes. And after the videotapes come in the CDs and the DVDs. And you know, like uh, the structure and the human infrastructure and the net keeping, you know, going and going and going per years. It was like the same people, um, but the technology changed, you know, mm -hmm. and what we'll have, uh, what we'll understand right now with the, like, weekly packet is coming from, you know, many, many, many years before. And this video game is trying to, you know, show, like, uh, the video game have, like, um, give, you, give you the experience to open a business in this time and keeping developing your business, changing all the materials, like, buying new uh, technology and, and yeah it's very focusing uh, small details about how the computers look in the beginning like uh, how uh, the aesthetic of the books in the beginning like um, and things like that what actually gave us the idea to this game is that one um, one important content of El Paquete is like mobile phone applications, no? Because like you cannot have access to the Apple App Store, or the Google Play Store, so people have to get their apps on their phones another way, no? Like via uh, connecting their phones to their computers and finding these apps that somebody else downloaded for them somewhere, no? And uh, there's a specific folder always for new mobile phone apps in El Paquete, and we kind of noticed that Cubans are actually very crazy about like business simulation games, yeah? Games like... Um, um, resort tycoon or farm will or something like this, no, where you kind of run your own business, and uh, we, we we found that quite peculiar, no, given that the informal economy in Cuba is still like kind of very very much um, like kind of uh, or, or the non-state economy is still very much restricted. So we had this idea to make a business simulation game about these like kind of alternative data distribution networks that uh, exist since the 70s. So in our game, you are, you are basically yeah turn your uh, turn like kind of one room uh, of your house uh, into like kind of a, a, a data or a media shop and you pl start in the 70s renting out novels and then you can reinvest your money in the 90s in like VHS players and TVs to copy them until you arrive at like kind of hard drives and to yeah what is El Paquete Semanal now. Yeah, for us, it's like one of the interesting thing about the video game is like uh, it's giving you like uh, this idea of the experience to make decisions in relation with this phenomenon. Like, if you make like a documental film, like you can just see like uh, what will happen, but in a video game, you make your own decisions about like what do you want to buy first, like, and you know, the game is change, like how good you are, independent of what type of technology you are paying more attention and things like that. And, and for us, it was the perfect media for, you know, try to talking about this specific phenomenon. Exactly. Then we switch to um, the work you're going to see here tonight, which is called Fragile Connections, and which is also based on like kind of an alternative underground uh, Cuban data distribution network. And um, 
This, um, this network that is like kind of documented here in this work uh, is called SNET and it's like basically a grassroots um, computer networks that like Cuban technology enthusiasts uh, have uh, built. Um, it's a computer network that is completely disconnected uh, from the internet but has like, uh, has like connects tens of thousands of households in Havana and allows users uh, to play multiplayer video games, chat, send messages, debate in forums, share files, host web websites, but all like kind of in its own completely, uh, completely self-constructed uh, infrastructure that is completely yeah, not connected to like kind of the internet as we know, no? And this network basically relies on, uh, again, a human network of thousands of participants who collaboratively create, operate, and maintain the hardware and the infrastructure of this network. And it, its material base consists of like miles of, or kilometers of Ethernet cable running across streets and balconies, Wi-Fi antennas that are mounted on huge poles as this pole that we here <laughs> try to recreate uh, on rooftops. No, because like Wi-Fi, the Wi-Fi signal needs like line of sight links. As soon as you have like kind of a tree or a big building uh, in between, then the signal is lost. So like kind of the people, the administrators of this network really have to like always build these huge towers for their antennas, um, yeah, um, you, they also, like there's an, an army of like uh, uh, network switch operator, like volunteer node administrators that keep that network alive. And yeah, our installation tries to like not only tell the history of that phenomenon or that network a bit, but also like kind of repli replicate the technological setup of, of such an SNET node point in that network. Yeah, um, the, the history of this community is starting like everywhere, like making LAN parties. And, you know, like after like you start to, you know, make a LAN party is actually not an easy thing because you must to take the computer, like move everybody to the same place. And, you know, after like they, they, they start to thinking like, OK, we'll need to try to find another way to, you know, get connections and, and play from home. And this was the beginning of, of the net. The net, like uh, right now, is like uh, in all Havana, but also we have like a, a small and older different nets in different cities in all Cuba. Um, and for example, this is a typical uh, server uh, pillar that you can find in one like a very tall building in the center of Vedao. That is one of the center yeah. neighborhood in Havana. And this and this network administrator can basically with each of these antenna connect like one or two hundred users. No, so this is actually like a really important like nodal point in the network. Another thing that is very peculiar in, in, in SNET and in Cuba is like, a, you know, we have like a two big problems. One is the weather, like, you know, these devices sometimes are not very well for like, very con contracts uh, weather, and it's a lot of like a raining in Cuba. This means that they must to create like a, these boxes of metal to, for, for protection, but also the, uh, you know, because these devices are like uh, illegal to get in in the country, are very difficult to find and very uh, expensive. This means that a lot of people steal the, the antennas, the Wi-Fi antenna from the roof. And this is why like uh, it's a lot of like, a, um, you know, like a chassis, like a metal protection things, very DIY aesthetic for try to not like, uh, you know, for try to save your own antenna and your in your roof. This is a very typical uh, server that we can find in any pillar. You know, they are just creating servers with whatever they can find. Normally, all this technology is coming because you know everybody in the community uh, pay, pay a fee. That normally coming like in, in Cuba, like if, if you know when I was a child, if everybody want to play football, everybody just put uh, a small money and will buy one ball for play football. And this is the thing, like SNET take these ideas or this practice and also this practice is using on, on the community right now. Like everybody is putting money like all the time and they just find any technology they can find and they just use this technology for server, for antennas and, and for everything. And this is a, a small video about one of the server that we actually find not in Havana, in Camagüey. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And uh, this network has always uh, had a very complex uh, relationship uh, with the state, no? because like kind of the uh, very author authoritative uh, Cuban state is, uh, you could say, very 
autonomy phobic. No, whenever there is some kind of uh, civil society initiative, people organizing themselves outside of the state, the state, um, the state representatives are, or, or the the seguridad, like kind of the state police, is always very much alarmed. No, like kind of, and for decades. Cubans have actually always been organized in like kind of political or mass organizations that were controlled by the state. No, there was like neighborhood uh, comités de la defensa de la revolución, for example, which nowadays are not so powerful anymore, but at some hmm. point actually they really were. Um, artists are like put into like kind of a, a, a state organized artist association, writers as well. No, so there is all these like kind of. Um, state provided like kind of infrastructure that like kind of really makes everyone like kind of a member that's that kind of that produces some kind of control no and whenever there is like kind of a civil society kind of initiative like esnet or like uh, el paquete semanal the state is always alarmed no and then you have like kind of this game that like kind of these people like um the people who compile El Paquito or the, the, the Esnet administrators, they say, no, like what we're doing has nothing to do with politics. This is just about entertainment. Um, there's also a lot of auto censorship, no, because like, um, yeah, um, these people involved in these networks are like kind of obviously very afraid that the state like shuts them down, no, like kind of, and this can like basically happen at every moment. So they kind of really, try to navigate um, things in a way that like kind of the state like doesn't see them as them as some kind of political danger but more as like kind of some some hobbyists yeah like a hobby or so no and this is like kind of a continuous like kind of source of like kind of conflict uh, and problems yeah at the end in Cuba everybody know like what is the limit you know and 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 they play with this like for example the weekly packets have like a two limitations no pornography and not like a material with uh, political content materials in the weekly packet. And this is a kind of a rule that all the people that is working in this, uh, you know, uh, system, like pay a lot of attention because like is, you know, like the people that are working in the weekly packet that ba basically, ba basically they live from working inside the weekly packet. They don't want to lose that. And it's more or less the same with the SNET. The big difference is SNET is more like a community. It's like, a, but they are, mainly focus in like game like we are talking about like a video game community that have a lot of more things that just not about like topic about video game but they don't play like they don't touch nothing about you know they don't allow any like a uh, political debate inside the net and also not pornography yeah but there actually was like kind of a, a, a very political point at some point no this network existed uh, exists at least since the early 2010s no and it really connects like tens of thousands of people and it provides like discussion forums and chat rooms so this is actually something this the state actually is like kind of scared about no and in 2019 um, well, I mean, actually, like in 2015 and 16, like state uh, or government-owned newspapers, like Granma, the, the 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 newspaper of the of the Communist Party, actually started writing some like actually really like kind of favorable articles about uh, about this net work. Uh, network administrators have also done like um, public presentation in like state-run like youth computer clubs. So there was actually this feeling that the state kind of accepts mm. this like kind of networks, even though the state always tries to keep all or a lot of things like in an extra legal gray zone so that they can always like kind of shut it down yeah. at each moment. But then what happened in 2019 uh, when Cuba again had like kind of a political change uh, that like there was a new president for the first time someone that is not from the Castro family running the country, um, Miguel Diaz-Canel. Around that time, some months after he took power, um, the government issued new, a new law, new uh, regulations about uh, about like running a Wi-Fi, no? Uh, about like Tele Wi-Fi. Telecommunications like are uh, exactly that, that 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 not change from the '97. Like was insane. Exactly. And what happened was that basically um, the allowed radio transmitter power was uh, power was uh, limited to, to, to such an extent that these like kind of long-range uh, Wi-Fi connections that this network is dependent on, no, because it really has to like cross hmm. like. Um, big parts of the city uh, was forbidden, no? And then, and this basically meant that like Esnet hit a legal brick wall and basically was like kind of declared illegal, no? And then actually um, there arrived this like kind of really interesting political point, no? Like kind of a, a small group of, um, of Esnet participants, a couple of hundred, staged a demonstration that you see here in front of the Ministry of uh, 
uh, communication yeah. and a demonstration is something that actually normally almost never happens in Cuba yeah. and this is actually like kind of a really really big thing and I think that was actually like in the last couple of years when people were also a bit better connected with WhatsApp that was one of the first of a kind of a few um, demonstration that then in 2021 led to this like kind of massive hmm. protest that were the biggest ones uh, over 30 in, over the, his, 30 in the history of Cuba actually, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that then had like kind of a lot of political repercussions by the government. Yeah. But like uh, there was also some really interesting like kind of online protests going on. So a lot of uh, a lot of SNET users uh, that were too scared to actually take it to the streets, they staged like online uh, demonstration in like kind of their favorite like online video games, like this one Black uh, Desert Online, for example, with this like Yo Soy SNET, I am SNET slogan in like kind of their in their like kind of speech bubbles, no? And then they posted these images in social media. Um, yeah, it's also like kind of a form of like kind of silent uh, protest against the change of this law. Yeah. But the SNET administrators, so the ones who are really like kind of on top of the structures and who like kind of oversee whole like kind of network nodes that connect like whole uh, neighborhoods, they kind of in the background negotiated with uh, the state institutions and these like youth computer clubs, which is like kind of a network of yeah, tele centers that like Fidel Castro himself, I think in the 80s or 90s Create, in yeah. created because he, he felt this could be like Cuba's digital future and like children already have to like hmm. get some like kind of digital education. And at the end of the of these negotiation stood that um, kind of an agreement that like uh, SNET node administrators have to like connect directly to these like kind of um, state uh, youth computer clubs. And also the network basically lost, lost its autonomy and also its decentralized structure and in its anonymity as well. No, like uh, when 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 it was just a random mesh network of 10,000 people, like you had your anonymity, like nobody in the, in the network knew who you are, just like kind of the node administrator you've been connected, but now it's really centralized. You have a login with your login code and basically now, as it is now, it can be completely controlled mm -hmm. um, by the state, no? But the, I would say the large majority of users, they don't really care because their main goal is just playing video games. For them, it's not like kind of a, place to like organize themselves politically or plan plan a new Cuban revolution. <laughs> um, and yeah. yeah, in this like so-called Tino Red, this network that connects the state-run intranet that connects all these like youth computer clubs, you can now play um, all World game. of Warcraft, all these games uh, in much better quality mm. and uh, uh, faster. Also, you know, one of the we we'll think like a, one of the questions that create this like uh, installation is exactly like this question. Like, what is the position, like uh, ethical or like you know moral position about wh how a community like that must to like you know act if they have a problem like that? If if we we'll think about voting, you know, most of the user of the community uh, are happy that at the end the community is still on ongoing, like uh, still working, and because of the connection of the Hoenn clubs in different parts of, of, of Cuba, the community right now is not just Havana, it's like an older country. This means that people from Havana be able now to play with people in an older cities, that this will be impossible before of the connection with the government. And also like uh, because, you know, they are for the first time using like a real technology, you know, the, the net is more fast, it's more organized, like because it's an institution you know, right now, like a plane or a rule inside the community. But from another hand, like Stefan say, like you completely lost auto aut autonomy, like it's completely centralized. It's, it's not anymore this community, like mm -hmm. SNET. And it's like, a, you know, uh, for our, in our installation, we have like a, a three, inter, inter, um, three usuarios of the net in different levels, like one admin, one like uh, people that are, is more in the middle, uh, it's, it's like a try to like a develop and software and try to help uh, you know to make the net working and and one usuarium like user. regular regular user and you know they have like a completely different like uh, opinion about this situation yeah. but then, most most of the people are <laughs> user you yeah. know and this is the thing so on these three screens you basically see this is kind of the documentation of our interview we'll turn the sound on in a second and we did this interview also over the network so we asked uh, our three like interview partners to play uh, their fa their favorite three video games uh, against each other and at the same time over TeamSpeak which is like kind of a voice over IP software that is very much 
used uh, for these like kind of online games, but that is actually also kind of the, the, the software infrastructure that keeps the whole network running. Um, so it's kind of the Google, you could say, of, 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 of SNET. So we, we used this audio channel for them, like kind of uh, for, for this interview. And we also used, uh, we also used um, the software for our English subtitles. So that is kind of, we kind of played with the same aesthetics of this, uh, of TeamSpeak, of this communication software. Uh, on the back here, on this like graphics that you see on the wall, this is basically our take or our interpretation of, um, of the network hierarchy. We kind of try to understand how this community organizes itself. Uh, yeah, and then the work also has like kind of an interactive part because this um, this network, this installation here also works as a real um, network node. Yeah. Um, you can see in these two uh, concrete walls, it's a very, very simple step-by-step -step that can allow you to use your own device and get, in, like, you know, get connection with this like, offline server. And you can navigate in, a, in, a, in some of the websites that are existing in SNET today and also be able to see a lot of photos about the antennas, the DIY solutions, the pillars, the servers, like, it's, and three videos that will make um, like a screen wax about the SNET community. Exactly. So this installation is basically like kind of a, an offline server where we put like kind of a lot of our research materials and we, which allows you to like kind of explore parts mm. of the network yourself. So if you open your mobile phones, then the, the network is called? La Red. That La is Red. actually the, the, you know, like uh, the real usuarians from SNET will never say SNET, will say La Red. Like which means the network. Too cold, too cold for, uh, you know, to, to say about what is the, the local like local name for this community exactly and then uh, when, once you connected with this like QR code you can basically like enter enter our server and one last part of the exhibition is actually the sticker that is here in this you know dark area this um, part of the project is actually like one of the most like a uh, funny because like uh, this part of the project is focusing try to you know show to the audience the language that exists just inside this community and how uh, like they auto represent identities inside the community. It's a lot of uh, stickers that are using in the time speak uh, forums. And normally like in SNET, you don't decide who you are, like and other people of the community decide who you are. And this means that, you know, if a person like, you know, when the people start to know you, they are giving you uh, stickers that represent your identity in, in, the, in the net. Exactly, these stickers are behind your name uh, in, in, in TeamSpeak. No? So uh, TeamSpeak, as we said, is a bit like kind of the software infrastructure of the network. Um, SNET users don't really have their own like kind of social media within that network, so they customize uh, um, they customize TeamSpeak in a way that makes it work a bit like a social network, no? And these like kind of little symbols behind their name, ah, yeah, exactly. It's either, either like kind of things somebody else gave to them, like an administrator, or that they use to like kind of describe themselves as a fan of a particular uh, football team, yeah. for example, Real Madrid versus like Barcelona, or some specific video game, or they are like a very bad, or exactly. they are good, like so, it's different things. Exactly. Like so have a these, couple. So the, yeah. these stickers, you can basically like give yourself uh, an SNET persona Auto, like the, the idea is like a very performative, like you can take the, you know, the, the stickers and just auto represent yourself here in the gallery. And it's like a, a list of all the concepts and, and what means H symbol that we'll have here. Then maybe we leave you uh, experiencing the work and we turn on the sound and you hopefully enjoy uh, our representation. Of Thank SNET. you for coming. Thank <laughs> you.